7. We are looking at a rather long chapter. I think, I didn't look, I meant to look, but I think it's the longest chapter in the book of Acts. Correct me if I'm wrong. If it's not, it's got to be close to the longest. It's also the longest sermon in the book of Acts. We think of sermons in Acts, you probably think of Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. But as far as the record goes, you know, that's not nearly as long as Stephen's in Acts 7. There is a sermon, though, in the New Testament that is longer than Stephen's. What sermon would that be? Sermon on the Mount. In fact, it covers three chapters. I didn't, you know, you don't count the verses, but uh, it would be longer, no doubt, than, than Stephen's. This sermon is one of the few in the book of Acts not spoken by an apostle. Stephen was not one of the apostles, but nonetheless, he was a man inspired of God. And this is both a sermon and his defense before the council. Now, some do not treat Acts 7 very favorably. You may have some commentaries. One says that Stephen's sermon is little more than a dull review of Jewish history with a few insults at the end. I don't care for that explanation of Acts 7. There are some folks who go so far to say that Stephen did wrong in Acts 7, that if he had used a more tactful approach, he never would have lost his life. So some say that this is just dull history and insults at the end, and some say Stephen actually did wrong. Both views overlook the fact that Stephen was what? Inspired of God. So if Stephen did wrong, who did wrong? God did wrong, and God does no wrong. So when I read comments like that, I just X them out in the book and X them out in my mind. And we're not for some good comments elsewhere. I throw the whole thing away. But sometimes these commentators do say a few good things from time to time. So you just take that with a grain of salt. So Stephen is going to defend himself against the charges against him. Remember that... Some of the charges were that he was guilty of blasphemy against the temple. He spoke blasphemous words against God and against Moses. All were trumped up false charges, but he's going to defend himself. He's also going to point out that his accusers are the, one who are the ones who are guilty, and they are the ones who need to repent. And then, of course, he's going to center his comments on Christ. We have every reason to believe that Stephen did not finish his sermon. He does not mention the resurrection, which was one of the key, obviously, aspects of Christianity. He does not mention the plan of salvation, as Peter would do in Acts 2 in the Apostles. So his sermon is going to be interrupted by those who heard enough. We'll get to that in the latter part of the chapter. So if we wonder why he didn't tell these folks what to do to be saved, well, I don't know that he was given a chance because they stopped him before that point. We have a lot in Acts 7. This is a chapter of history. I know that some roll their eyes at history. Adam would not be one, but uh, some people do not like history, or they say they don't. But everybody likes history, don't they? Whenever you get your old family albums out and look at those old pictures, what are you looking at? You're looking at history. You're interested in your family history. It probably won't ever make the front page or get in a book, but it's interesting to you. So we're all, we all have an interest in history. We're making it right now. And so this is a review of Jewish history. It's a good uh, review for us. Now, we could spend a long time, obviously, in Acts 7, going back and looking at all those verses in Genesis, Exodus, and so forth, but that's not the scope of this class, nor really of Stephen's sermon. He's just sort of hitting the high points, uh, is what he'll do here. And what he also does is he, he finds common ground with his audience. Now, again, keep in mind his audience would be the Jewish Sanhedrin, the council, and others who are present on that occasion. And before he tells them, you are lost and you need saving and you need to straighten up, before he gets to that, he begins in a diplomatic way 
talking about things, first of all, with which they would agree. He finds common ground. And I hope if we don't take anything else from the lesson tonight, that's one lesson we can obviously use. Whenever we try to talk to folks about the Bible, instead of walking up and saying, if you're not a Christian, you're lost. If you're not baptized, you're lost. That's a direct turnoff to most folks. So try to find common ground. Somebody's wearing a sports shirt, has their favorite team on the shirt. Hey, I like your shirt. I'm a, I'm a fan of that team too. And that might lead to a further conversation. You ladies, uh, there's a lady with a nice looking dress. You say, I, I admire your dress. Where'd you get it? Well, I shop there too. So you, you try to find something that we have in common to break the ice, as we say, and uh, maybe strike up a friendship, a conversation, and then we might be in position to help somebody who needs helping in a spiritual way. That's what Stephen does here. Now, two basic parts of the chapter, his defense, verses 1 to 53, and then his death, 54 to 60. We're not going to cover all of that, obviously, this evening, but we will, as Stephen does, we'll hit the high points. Verses 1 through 8, he reminds them of God's covenant with Abraham. So verse 1, I'll read verses 1 to 4. Then said the high priest, are these things so? And he said, Stephen said, men, brothers, and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And said to him, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. In fact, I'll stop reading for a moment right there. Again, the high priest, he's the top of the line as far as the Jews are concerned. He's over the council. We said earlier this could have been Annas or Caiaphas, but probably Caiaphas because he is the uh, acting high priest, Annas, the former high priest. Probably as we ended chapter 6, everybody looked at Stephen's face and it appeared as what? appeared as the face of an angel, and that probably caused people to stop and pause for just a second, including the high priest. But if so, he gathers himself, and now he asks the question, are these things so? What things is he asking about here? Are these things, what things? The accusations, exactly right. The accusations we read back in uh, chapter 6, 11, they bribed men to say that Stephen spoke blasphemy against Moses, against God, against the temple. Well, is that true? That's what high priest is saying. Say something, Stephen. Are these things true? Legally, Stephen did not have to respond. Just as in trials today, the defendant does not have to take the what? The stand. The defendant does not have to take the witness stand a lot of cases, his or her lawyer will advise, don't take the witness stand, even if they are innocent. Because that's a pressure-packed seat, and DAs know how to twist things and get you all confused. And if he can get you to get angry, well, you've blown it. <laughs> that's not a good thing, even if you're innocent. So, you know, I different trials, different situations, but he does not have to legally answer, but he's given a chance to speak about Christ, and you can believe that he wants to do that. So are these charges true, Stephen? And Stephen responds, verse 2, very respectfully, right? Very respectfully. Men, brothers, fathers, listen. Now, we need to be respectful to people in high places. We may not respect the person, but we do respect the what? The position. We may not respect the person, but we do respect the position that person holds. And so Stephen, as we've already seen in Acts with Peter and, and John and others, very respectful to those who've arrested him and now to those who are trying him. Now the Jews, of course, love their history. They love Jewish history, so he's going to start with something they love. And that was by purpose, obviously. The God of glory. Now, the, the charge was blasphemy against God. 
Doesn't sound like Stephen's blaspheming God, does it, when he calls God the God of glory? We're going to see at the end of the chapter, we also are going to read of the God of glory. And you might as well say you have the glory of God on Stephen's face. At least it was the face of an angel, and angels come from God. So uh, he is re really refuting the charge of blasphemy against God by the very man of respect he has for God. And again, we go back to some of these commentaries, and some of them say that there are all sorts of historical errors in Stephen's sermon. In fact, some of them count seven. Seven errors or blunders that Stephen made in this sermon, and they are quick to uh, address those. But keep in mind, before whom Stephen is standing, these are experts in the law. They know the law like they know the back of their hand. And you can believe that if he made an error in Jewish history, they would have been the first to have objected and to have pointed out his error. But they are silent regarding any supposed error that Stephen made. And again, Stephen's inspired as he speaks this, and Luke is inspired as he writes this. So there are no errors there. And we'll look at some of the alleged contradictions as, as we go. In fact, some would say that there is one in verse 2. Stephen says, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in... If you're using the King James, you've got C-H-A-R-R-A-N. That's just a variant spelling of Haran, H-A-R-A-N. So don't let that, that, that confuse you. So an alleged error is... Critics say that God appeared to Abraham in Herod with the command of verse 3. Stephen says that God appeared unto Abraham before he dwelt in Herod. Now Genesis eleven thirty one 31 to 12, 3 speak of God's appearing to Abraham in Herod. Stephen says God appeared to Abraham before he lived in Herod, and so the critic says a Bible contradiction. But could God not have appeared twice to Abraham? Once, when he, once before he lived in Haran and once after he lived in Haran? That's no problem whatever. God often revealed himself to his people and appeared to Abraham more than one time, obviously, so there's no, no contradiction there. God appears and said, Abraham, get out of thy country, get away from your family, and come into the land which I shall show you. I want you to pack up and move. I want you to leave town. I want you to leave home. I want you to leave your family. Why would God give Abraham that command? What was it about Abraham's country and family that he needed to get away from? They were wicked. They were idolaters, okay? They were idolaters. Sometimes you just have to move. To get a, God knows that he's not going to make Abraham the man, that, or Abraham will not become the man he will become if he stays where he is. And, and after all, of course, Haran or Mesopotamia is not the land of promise. So I want you to pack up, and I want you to leave. Would that have been an easy thing to do? Would it be easy for you? I think with some people it might be easy. There's some people who like to move. And there's nothing wrong with that. And you'll hear, well, they've moved here, they've moved there, they don't seem to put down roots anywhere, and that's not a sin at all. Nothing wrong with, wrong with moving and moving and moving. You might better yourself by doing that. Me, I'm not like that. I do not like to move. I don't like to pack. I don't like to lug things. I don't like change. Okay? I don't like to move. But if God says move, you know, Wayne better start packing his bags, right? And God said, Abraham, I want you to move, and I'm not going to tell you where you're going. Did Abraham move? He moved. That's a man of faith. He took the command of God, and we're not saying it was easy for him to say goodbye, but he loved God, and so move he did. And so verse 4 said he did. Verse 4 says he came out of the land of the Chaldeans. This, was, this would be the area of Babylon in later years. And dwelt in Haran, that's upper Mesopotamia. And from there, who died in Haran? Abraham. 
Somebody died in Haran. Verse 4. His dad. Who was his dad? Who was Abraham's dad? Starts with a T. E. R. A. Terra. Terra, Terra, whatever. That was his dad. And he died. He moved also from Chaldea to Haran at least. And he probably would have moved further, but he died. And so Abraham's dad died there in Haran. And then after his dad died, he moved into this land where we're living. That was the land of Canaan, called the land of Canaan in Abraham's day, called the land of Israel in Stephen's day. And the Greeks and Romans called this land Palestine. All the same land with different names. Canaan, Israel, and Palestine. All the same land. That's where we're living right now. All right? Verse 5. He gave him, who's the he? God gave, who's the him? Abraham. That's where I like my capital pronouns. That helps me out. God gave Abraham no inheritance in the land of Canaan or Palestine or Israel, whatever you want to call it. Now, Abraham did buy a place to bury his dead. Remember that? He did buy a lot to bury his dead, but that was not inheritance. That was not a gift. That was a purchase. So that's not factored in to what Stephen's saying here. While Abraham was alive, he did not have as much as to set his foot on, not an inch of ground by inheritance, that is. Nonetheless, God promised that he would give this land to Abraham for a possession and to his seed or descendants after him. And God made the promise before Abraham had what? A child. I'm going to give you and to your descendants this great land. And Abraham is not even a dad yet when God made the promise. To accept that again was an act of great faith to believe that promise. God spoke in this way, verse 6, that Abraham's seed, so seed should sow. There's a Sally sells she seashells, right? His seed should sojourn in a strange land. And they should bring them into bondage. What land is he talking about in verse 6? Abraham's descendants were put in bondage in what country? The land of Egypt. Okay, this, of course, God's telling Abraham this hundreds of years before it ever happened. Stephen's saying this hundreds of years after it happened. And this is a view, a view of history. So God said, Abraham, your descendants one day will be living in a strange land, a foreign land. Foreign land is the idea, the land of Egypt. And they would bring them into bondage. They would be enslaved there and would be mistreated. How many years? 400 years. The exact number was how many years? Do you remember? 430. 430. That's Exodus 12. Stephen says 400 years. Is there a discrepancy between Exodus 430 and Stephen's 400? What, what's he doing? What we often do? Round off numbers. What time is it? It is, it is uh, what, 6.50? Probably 20 seconds. You don't tell somebody the time like that. You'll say it's 10 to 7. You won't give them the seconds. You'll round it off. How much did you pay for your car? $20,000. Well, it was actually $20,011.55. You don't tell the exact amount. You round it off. And you know you're not going to get much of a car for $20,000, right? But it, it be that as it may. We round off numbers just like they round off numbers. No discrepancy. Seven, but I'm going to judge. God says, I'm going to, the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. How did God judge the land of Egypt? What did he do? Plagues. How many plagues were there? Ten. Okay. We won't go into all of those, but that's how God judged them. And then by that time, after the tenth plague... The Egyptians were all too happy, correct, to drive the Israelites out of the land. That's what it took. Of course, Pharaoh changed his mind. But 
After that, they shall come forth and shall serve me in this place that is in this land. So verse 8, God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. This was a sign between the Jews and God. The Jews were not the only people to circumcise their males. There were other countries that did that, but God did specify for every Jew, Jewish male, to be circumcised. That is not a salvation issue today as we realize that may be a hygienic issue for some, but it was a requirement of obedience under the law of Moses and before the law of Moses. Did Abraham live under the law of Moses? No, he lived long before Moses ever came along, okay? So he lived before Moses, but the circumcision was given before the law of Moses even came. And so Abraham begat Isaac, or became the father of Isaac, circumcised him the eighth day. Abraham was a grown man when he was circumcised. And uh, I'm sure you'd rather be a baby than a man to have that. But anyway, he obeyed as well. Isaac became the father of Jacob. And Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs. So up to now in Stephen's sermon, what about the audience? Are they in agreement? They don't find a thing wrong with what Stephen said so far. They're saying, preach it, amen, keep on, brother. Uh, they lay like what they're hearing. Common ground. Maybe Stephen's winning them over. Everything's good. Now, Stephen speaks of the patriarchs and introduces a new theme, the theme of rejection. He's going to point out that in the Jewish history, they often rejected people God had sent to deliver them. And he'll bring his sermon to a climax by saying, just as you rejected who? Jesus. That's, that's, why, that's what he's going to lead up to. But he's a long way from that. He's going to point out and they'll say, we, we, we know, we're right. Our fathers did reject their deliverers. And, of course, he begins now with Joseph. Adam, if you will, 9 through 14. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. And delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a famine over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's family was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred. Uh, 75 souls. Okay. So back to 9. Again, this is, they knew this. We know this. We know all these familiar passages. The patriarchs, why were they moved with envy against Joseph? Why? Why were they jealous? He had a coat of many colors, right? He was the only brother that got one. And Put yourself in their shoes. Twelve kids. One kid gets a brand new bike every year. And you ride, ride that old rattle trap every year. Going to make you ill? It would make anybody ill, wouldn't it? On top of that, Joseph had some what? Dreams. About people bowing, about them bowing down to him. Well, that just added fuel to the fire. And so the King James says the patriarchs were moved with envy. Do you have another translation besides envy? Another word. Jealousy. Jealousy. There's not a lot of difference between the two, correct? Envy and jealousy. Somebody gave this difference, and it's, it's really hard to beat, I think. Envy wants to have what somebody else has. Jealousy wants to have what it already has. Envy wants to have what someone else has. Say somebody else's wife. But a man who's jealous is jealous over his own wife. So there's a bit of difference between the two. And maybe envy's the better choice here. But 
both are the same. And of course we know, we know that one day Joseph came to his brothers, they were out in the field and they said, here comes this dreamer, let's do what to him? Kill him. Kill him. At first they intended to kill him. One brother stepped in and calmed them down and said, uh, let's don't go that far. That brother was who, by the way? Reuben. Okay, Reuben. And his intent was, well, I'll come back later and get Joseph and take him back home. Well, Reuben walked off or whatever, something happened. And so the decision was made to do what to Joseph? Sell him into slavery. How much money did they get? 20 pieces of silver. How much was Jesus sold for? 30. Okay, so there's a little bit of difference between the two. And so they sell him. It was Judah's idea to sell him into slavery. In other words, he had the idea, we'll kill two birds with one stone. We will get rid of Joseph, and we'll make money to boot. That's a lot better than killing him. And so that's the plan of action they took. And off into Egypt, Joseph went. But who was with Joseph? God was with him, and that made all the difference. And you can trace Joseph's life, and you can see God with Joseph every step of the way. In fact, verse 10, God delivered Joseph out of all his afflictions. Remember, tempted by Potiphar's wife, wound up in prison. And God got him out of prison. He gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And, of course, had the dreams, and Pharaoh and, uh, Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, and finally Pharaoh made Joseph governor over Egypt and all his house. And, of course, that was by design. God knew what he was doing. Because of verse 11, there came a, King James says, dearth. What is a dearth? Famine. Came a famine. That word dearth is an old English word. You have the word deer. See the word deer? D-E-A-R, something very costly, and then T-H, the lack of something costly, okay? So famine is the, the meaning, of up-to-date meaning of that word. How long was this famine supposed to last? How many years? Seven years, right? There were seven years of plenty, and they just brought in crops by the bucket loads if you will or whatever and then the promise was after that there will be seven years of famine and it's going to be bad that was the interpretation and that came to pass and it was even bad in the land of Canaan also verse 11 says our fathers found no sustenance or what food or food found no food and if you don't have food uh, that's Desperate times, right? Desperate times. And so as we know, verse 12, Jacob hears that there is what in Egypt? Corn? Keep in mind, in 1611, the word corn did not mean corn as we think of corn on a cob. It meant grain, either rye or barley or, or wheat. Uh, there was grain in Egypt. And so Jacob says, go down there in Egypt and buy us some food. But Jacob did not send which brother? Benjamin. I lost Joseph, he thought, and I'm not going to lose Benjamin, so he's not going. Thirteen. Well, they ate up all that food and the famine was still there. They didn't buy enough for seven years. They might not have been sold enough for seven years. But in any event, they had to go back, verse 13. This time Benjamin went, and of course we know all of that. Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. And what was their reaction? I am Joseph. What was their reaction? They were very afraid. Why? What did they think? We did wrong, and what's he going to do to us? I had the same feeling. Now, that, that fear sort of subsided until who eventually died? Jacob. And then they became afraid again. They're thinking, well, Joseph was nice to us while Dad was alive, but now that Dad's gone, we're going to get it. But Joseph wasn't that kind of man. Okay, but that's, that's, of course, at the end of it all. 
And so uh, Joseph was made known to his brothers, verse 13. In fact, his family was made known to Pharaoh. And Joseph said, Dad, why don't you come down to Egypt and live? Verse 14. So then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him. And all his kindred three score or 75 souls. And Jacob and his family came and lived in what part of Egypt? Goshen. Why did they not live with the rest of the Egyptians? The Egyptians, something was an abomination to the Egyptians. Egyptians. Shepherds. Shepherds were an abomination to the Egyptians. And so, well, you're welcome to live here. You stay in your land, we'll stay on ours. You live in Goshen, and they did. Everybody came. How many came? 75. Acts 7, 14 says 75. Well, the Bible critic raises his hand once again and says, wait a minute. Genesis 46, 27 says, how many? 70. 70. Not 75. But keep in mind, you've got some of the family already living in Egypt, correct? They're not counted in the 70, perhaps, and some of the wives may not have been counted, so there's no contradiction between the two. It depends on who you're counting, who's already there, and then who's moving. Joseph would not have moved to Egypt. He's already there. His kids are already there. His wife's already there. Okay, so that uh, could very well be uh, a difference there. Well, did Jacob go down? The Bible says he did, verse 15. He went down to Egypt and, and died. It's not that when he set foot in Egypt, he died, dropped dead. The Bible says he lived 17 years in Egypt. Okay? Stephen is sum, summarizing things. He's covering a lot of history in a very short time. Okay? So he came to Egypt. He would live 17 years in Egypt. Eventually he would die. He and our fathers. And were they buried in Egypt? Did they bury them in Egypt? No. 16... They were carried back to Shechem. They brought them back home, in other words, and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. Does it matter where you're buried? Does it matter to you where you're buried? It mattered to them. Now, it mattered to them where they were buried. We don't want to be buried in Egypt. We want to be buried back home with our fathers. You know, is that just a custom? Is there something to that? I don't know that it matters where we are buried. It does to some people. I used to say, bury me in Tennessee. You know, that's the land of promise, bury me in Tennessee. But I've lived in Mississippi longer than I lived anywhere. And it's a mighty good place to live. So I don't care where I'm buried. Really what happens to my body doesn't matter. Uh, it'll be resurrected in the end anyway. So Mississippi, Tennessee, cremated, eaten by sharks, whatever, uh, we'll, we'll be resurrected anyway. But it mattered to them. They wanted to be buried where they wanted to be buried, back, back home. Again, does anybody have a problem with Stephen's sermon up to now? Of course not. Amen. We agree, Stephen. You're not such a bad fellow after all. Maybe, maybe we need to rethink about you. Adam 17 through... 21. When the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till so another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt treacherously with our kindred, and evil oppressed our fathers, so that they cast out their young children, so that they may not, so that they might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair, and brought up in his father's house three months, and he was cast out, where his daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. All right, so, again, just sort of coming down the line of Jewish history. Verse 17, when the time of the promise drew near. What, what promise is he talking about? What promise? About, about that back in, in the, the promise of the land, you know, going back to the land. Keep in mind, as of this time, Israel is in Egypt. As of, as of Stephen's sermon, at this juncture, they're still in Egypt. God did not want them to remain in Egypt. And so... The people are in Egypt, they're multiplying, they're growing. 
What did the Egyptians think about the numbers of the Hebrews? Are they happy? Afraid, aren't they? In fact, there are so many Jews, if we get in battle with an oppressive nation, uh, an enemy nation, the Jews might just join them and beat us. So we need to reduce the Jewish population. That's verse 18. Keep in mind, Stephen's covering a lot of history in a very short time. Another king arose, verse 18, who did not know Joseph. I don't take that to mean he didn't have a clue that there was a Joseph, but he did not acknowledge Joseph. He didn't care for Joseph or Joseph's people, may have been the meaning there. So 19, this king dealt subtly, or what? Treacherously, with shrewdly, or some other word, with our family, our forefathers. And evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. It seems that Stephen is saying that some of the Jews actually did obey Pharaoh. And did, if a baby was born, cast it out. And obviously it would not live. Well, in that time, of course, Moses was born. And he was exceeding fair. Have you ever seen an ugly baby? Any parent ever say, I've got the ugliest kid you've ever seen? <laughs> well, Moses was a good-looking baby, right? At least to Amram and who? Jochebed. What's the old saying? Homely at the cradle, pretty at the table. Ever heard of that? That's some Barney Fife wisdom there. Homely at the cradle, pretty at the table. Well, Moses wasn't homely at the cradle. He was beautiful, good-looking, lovely. Brought up in his father's house how long? Three months. How they kept that baby quiet for three months, probably a, almost a miracle, right? You can't keep a baby quiet three minutes sometimes, but they hid that baby for three months, and there's a lot of tension there. We don't know why. Maybe somebody told on them. That may have been what happened. We don't know that. But it came time that they had to take baby Moses and do what with him? Put him in that ark of bulrushes and put him in the river. But they put him strategically where who often bathed? Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, this was all by plan. And she comes to the river for bathing and she hears the baby crying and says, this is a Jewish baby boy. And her heart goes out to him. And the Bible says, 21, she nourished him for her own son. So Moses grew up where? He grew up in Egypt. Verse 22 says that he was learned or educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Does this sound like Stephen is blaspheming Moses? That was a charge. He spoke in words of blasphemy against Moses. It doesn't sound like he's blaspheming Moses at all. And, of course, the Bible critic raises his hand and says, hold on, hold on here. We've got another contradiction. Stephen says that Moses was mighty in words. What was Moses' estimate of himself speaking? I'm not eloquent in words. But what was Moses trying to do when he said that? He's trying to get out. Of going to Pharaoh. Send somebody else. Somebody better than me. He's trying to get out. That's why he said that. He actually was a man mighty in words and in deeds. A very learned man. Okay, so Moses. In, how many years did Moses stay in Egypt? How many years? Forty. You divide Moses' life into three 40-year periods. Forty years in Egypt. The next 40 years would be spent... Midian doing what? Shepherding sheep. And the final 40 years, he'd get Israel out of Egypt and then be in the wilderness. He died age 120. Moses grew up an Egyptian, but by heart he was a Jew. By race he was a Jew. By culture an Egyptian, but a Hebrew by heart. He knows he is a Hebrew. And so... Verse 23, when he was 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. 
And 24, he saw one of the Egyptians hurting one of the Jews. And Moses steps in and avenged him who was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. From that, we might think that Moses just beat him up. But the Bible says what? He killed him. What did he do with his body? Buried in the sand, just like who had centuries before buried his brother. Cain. Okay. And so Moses thinks he's gotten by, correct? Nobody saw what happened here. Hid the body in the sand. 26, the next day, he appeared to them. And now you've got two Jews fighting each other for some strange reason. They're fighting. And he's trying to reconcile them. He pulls them apart and says, your brothers, your Jews, why are you hurting each other? 27, he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away saying, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Will you kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? What he thought Moses thought was secret was public knowledge. What does Moses do? He gets out of Dodge, right? He leaves town. 29, he fled of the saying and was a stranger in the land of Beth Midian. Whenever you translate from Hebrew to Greek, you'll have variant spellings. Most of your, your translations just say Midian. That's the land of Midian. Where he begat two sons. Now back, back to verse 25 for a moment. Uh, I skipped that. When Moses killed the Egyptian, he thought his, Jew, his brothers, his Jews, would understand how that God by his hand would deliver them. That happened 40 years before the burning bush experience. So Moses knows all along that he's to be the deliverer of the Jews. 40 years later, in that burning bush, God would reinforce the fact. But Moses knew all along he was supposed to be the deliverer. So he flees to Midian. Has how many boys? Two. Who was Moses' wife? Starts with a Z. Zipporah. Anybody know his two sons? Gershom. He may have had more than those two, Gershom and Eliezer. I wouldn't have known either, but I looked. <laughs> I looked. I, I can't remember all of that either. He, uh, but anyway, again, everybody says amen. Stephen, we agree uh, exactly with everything that you've said. And preach on. Preach on. And Stephen's about to preach on, but we're about preached out because we're out of time. And so uh, next Wednesday, Lord willing, we will pick up in verse number 30 and do our best to wrap up chapter 7.